Amen. That's a tough act to follow, Billy. But uh, I might start doing some things he's doing, incorporating like in my sermons. When I raise my hands, you all amen. You know, or uh, I'm learning. See, Billy, you're teaching me, brother, as we as we go. Church, it's good to see you. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. I know it is. Uh, it's cold and it's it's snowing a little bit outside and. Uh, uh, but that's okay. Austin, you can have all of that, brother. Uh, he can have, the older I get, the more I like warm weather. I don't know about you all, uh, but uh, I am attracted more to the sunshine and, and the warm weather. But we, we, we do with what we do with, right? You get what you get and you don't throw a fit. Amen? And so it's good to be here. Hope you had a good week. You know, and I don't know about you, but this week for some odd reason just felt a little bit more positive to me. Um, I know that we are starting to see uh, the vaccine get distributed throughout Kentucky to some folks. And I know for some that may not be as exciting for you as it is for me. But for me, uh, I think it's great news. Uh, I know some of our folks here have already received it. And if you have any questions about that, you can see me afterwards and I can connect you to a couple of those folks if you've got some concerns or or questions, but I, I pray, and I know you all have been praying for this for months, for God to deliver this, and God has done his job, amen, and he's still doing his job, there's more on the way, and so I know that we're a little anxious, I know we're a little fearful with it, um, but you know, God don't work on our time, does he? God works on his time, you know, would we feel better about it if it was a year from now, two years from now? And, and so I know there's a lot of questions, and adults have to make their own decisions about what they do. But I'm just excited about it because I've got people that's already called me and texted me, emailed me, and said, Brother Donnie, as soon as I get it, I'm back to church. And for me, that excites me. And uh, that's what I know a lot of our folks are looking forward to. So continue praying uh, for that. Also, if you got your Bible, let's open up to the Gospel of John. Chapter 6, verses 1 through 13 is what we're going to be looking at today. If you don't have a Bible, there's one in front of you. Get that out as we work through God's Word together this morning. Hopefully you've got your bulletin with you as well. Your sermon outline is in your bulletin. So go ahead and grab that. Open that up. As we work through God's Word together, and uh, hopefully there's a pencil or a pen there in front of you as well as we work through this sermon this morning. You know, I heard about a pastor who placed this sign on his door, and it says, If you have problems, come in and tell me all about them. If you don't have any problems, come in and tell me how you avoid them. Uh, it kind of seems like the world that maybe we're living in nowadays. Amen. You know, many times life's problems and situations, they have a way of testing our what? Our, our faith. There are times in our lives when we try to handle or solve problems thinking to ourselves, if I just had more money, if I just had more resources, and before you know it, the money isn't there, maybe the resources aren't there, and we start becoming pessimistic, and our hope starts to dwindle. And there are also times in our lives when issues occur, and we, we feel we have a little, but there's no way a little will ever do, so we, we have some optimism, but we find ourselves having a questioning faith, a faith that is present, but there seems to be more questions than answers. That ever been you? So this morning, I want to present to you three differing kinds of faith, and I want to, I want to test you per se. I mean, that's the title of the sermon this morning. Is this is a test? So I want to test you per se into asking yourself, which one of these am I? So let's read John chapter six. Look at verses one. Through 13, as we read God's word together. So, sometime after this, Jesus crossed to the far shore of the Sea of Galilee, that is the Sea of Tiberias, and a great crowd of people followed him because they saw the miraculous signs he had performed on the sick. 
And then Jesus went up on a mountainside and he sat down with his disciples. The Jewish Passover feast was near. When Jesus looked up and he saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, he said, Philip, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked this only to what? To test him. For he already had in mind what he was going to do. And Philip answered him, well, eight months wages wouldn't be enough bread for each one of these to have a bite. Another of the disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, he spoke up. He said, well, here's a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish, but how far will they go among so many? And then Jesus said, have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place, and the men sat down, about 5,000 of them. And then Jesus took the loaves, and he gave thanks, and he distributed it to those who were seated as much as they wanted, and he did the same way with the fish. And when they had all had enough to eat, he said to the disciples, Gather the pieces that are left over. Let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them, and they filled the twelve baskets with the pieces of the five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this new day. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to be in your house, Lord, today. God, we thank you for the music this morning. Thank you for Brother Billy and, Lord, leading us and letting us worship your holy name. And so, Father, now as we call upon wanting to see you, Lord, God, we want to see you do something great today. Father, I pray right now that every heart and every ear, Lord, be open. God, I pray today if there's some here that are hurting in their faith, God, let them be restored this morning. Father, let them rededicate, Lord, to you. Father, if there's some here this morning that are lost and don't know who Jesus is in their life, Father, I pray today that you knock on that door and that they answer, Lord, that they respond. God, we want to see you work in such a great way. Lord, it was so awesome seeing Lucas give his life to you and being in this baptism. And God, our, our hearts call out for that, Lord. We, we yearn for that to see people, kids and teenagers and whatever adults, ages of all sorts, Lord. We, we pray, we want to see people get saved and give their hearts to you. Father, this world, it has enough darkness in it already. Father, we need to increase the light. And Father, to do that, Lord, we want to see people get saved. We want to see you at work. And God, we know you're here, Lord. Father, you're here in a great way. You said you never leave us. You never abandon us. And so, God, I ask right now today, Lord, that you would work in hearts. That you would work in lives today, Lord. Let faith be renewed today. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. And all of God's people said, Amen. Now the location of this event is explained in verse 1. Jesus and his disciples, they are on the eastern shore of Galilee. We know this because the other side of the lake was considered to be uh, the east side since most Jewish activity occurred on the west side. We also know it's springtime. Well, Brother Donnie, how do we know that? Well, because the Bible says what was near. The Passover was near. This great festival where thousands of people would come in and take over Jerusalem and the surrounding suburbs. We also know this certain miracle is the only one that's mentioned in all four what? Gospels. This alone is significant. The book of Matthew says that Jesus retreated to this location because he had been told of the death of John the Baptist by John's disciples. The book of Mark says they retreated to this location of solitude for rest, but the crowd saw them leave and they followed on foot. The book of Luke gives insight that maybe Jesus left to this location to put space between himself and Herod, the one who had beheaded who? John. We're not completely sure why Jesus chose this spot, but we are confident of understanding of why the people of why the crowds follow. John says the crowds follow because they had seen the what? The signs. 
They'd seen the signs. If the crowds had witnessed signs of Jesus, the miracle man, then this means they had been following Jesus more than likely for some time now. And it makes sense to believe that they had heard of Jesus turning the water into wine. How would something like that stay quiet? But John says they were following because of the signs that he had performed on the sick or in the disease in verse 2. Miracles such as the healing of the official son described in chapter 4. And what a miracle it was because Christ healed the official son who was in Capernaum, although Jesus was in Cana of Galilee about 14 miles away. And here's what's so significant with that healing. Jesus healed that boy at the very moment when he said, Your son will live at that very moment. Or maybe they heard of the healing of the man that had been a paralytic for 38 years in John chapter 5. Maybe they had heard about more healings or more signs at this point that's not listed in the Bible. You say, well, Brother Donnie, what do you mean? Well, John 21, 25 says that Jesus did many other things as well. If every one of them had been written down, I suppose that even the whole world would not have room for the books that would have been written. Let me ask you this, church. Are you ready? If you had witnessed one of those signs, or if you had heard that this man of miracles could heal the sick, would you have followed? Would you have followed? Would you have traveled miles on foot to follow this man that was doing things that no one had ever seen, no one had ever witnessed at that time? If you had a child that was sick or a loved one that was dying, wouldn't you have followed? Wouldn't you have sought him no matter if you were a Jew or no matter if you were a Roman? If you stop and envision the scene, I can imagine Jesus sitting there with his arms bent on top of his knees and he looks up and he sees this great crowd of people coming towards him. This great crowd, they were people that had followed him around the lake on foot and pilgrims who were caught up in all the excitement hearing about the miracles and hearing about the signs that Jesus had been performing. And even though Jesus may have been tired, he was still human, by the way. He used this opportunity to demonstrate two concerns. He used this opportunity to test and to strengthen the disciples' faith. Jesus provoked this test. He looked at Philip and said in verse 5, He said, Where are we to buy bread so that they may eat? Well, Jesus already knew what He was going to do in this situation. Amen? But how would the disciples handle such a situation that looked so bleak, that looked without hope? In verse 6, John tells us that Jesus was testing him. You know, I remember when I was a kid growing up in the 80s, and we'd be watching cartoons on Saturday morning, whether if it was Transformers or G.I. Joe or Bugs Bunny, whoever it would be. And there was one thing that would always irk me so bad on a Saturday morning, right when the cartoons started getting good. Right when the plot just started thickening, all of a sudden the screen would go black and you would hear these words. This is a test of the emergency broadcast system. Right? And you're thinking to yourself, no! Not at the time, Lord, where things are getting good. This is a test of the emergency broadcast system. And we didn't have DVR back then. So if you missed it live, it was just, well, sorry. Maybe somebody else could fill you in, but everybody was listening to the same words. This is a test. But as usual, Jesus' timing was perfect. And this test would not only prove where Philip and Andrew were in their faith, but I also believe it speaks to us today as well in a mighty way. Philip replies, and he says this in verse 7 of the text. He says, 200 denarii worth of bread is not sufficient 
for them, for everyone to receive a little. So this is where your sermon outline begins this morning. Are you ready? See, what kind of faith was Philip expressing? Philip was expressing a pessimistic type of faith. He was expressing a pessimistic type of faith. This is the type of faith that's that's based on doubt. And it's based on the human aspect of how can we solve this problem by ourselves? How can we solve this problem with resources? How can we solve this problem with money? See, Philip solved the problem, but he did not see the answer. He didn't see the power. So Philip, off the top of his head, he throws out a monetary value. 200 denarii worth of bread. Jesus, it's not enough. And this type of thinking is typical when we have a faith of pessimism. You know, when we Christians start living like this, we definitely don't show others that we believe in the power of who? And the power of God. But what we do show is the power of hopelessness, and I believe there's plenty of that already going around in this world. Amen? It's everywhere that we look. When we give up and we profess that our issues or our problems are greater than our God's ability to meet or overcome, then we start to belittle not only our faith, but we start to belittle the power that's found in who? That's found in God. When we profess Jesus as Savior, we can profess Christ as the Creator. We can say that He had the power to meet the needs of the people. But when it gets personal, right? When it gets personal, an immediate problem arises. Do we really put our faith out there? Do we really show our trust in Jesus? See, Philip's faith, it was based off man's power to solve the issue, such as the availability of money, such as the availability of resources. You know, this is where we've been for so long in this world. For so long in this world, we said, well, God, we don't know what to do, but Lord, somebody's going to figure it out. Lord, we're going to try to handle this on our own. God, we're going to try to fix this. Lord, we're going to do whatever we have to do to fix this. And then we realize that with God, we can't do anything. And you say, well, Brother Diane, what do you mean? Well, the Bible says with God, all things are are possible. If God wants to create a vaccine in six months, guess what? God's going to do it. If God wants to heal a nation in six months, guess what? God's going to do it. If God wants to use you, if God wants to to be involved in the church, then God's going to press that upon you, I would hope, and then I hope you would do that. But with Philip, his faith had got to that point. He was a little pessimistic, and so he's looking around. He's like, well, I know how we solve this. We solve this with money, but God, there ain't even enough of that here. You know, I've seen a lot of churches crumble because their faith wasn't even the size of a mustard seed. I've seen a lot of churches crumble because they said, well, we don't have the money. We can't do this and we can't do that. So every time something got brought up, guess what it was? Well, we just can't what? We can't do that. And you know what? You may be right. Maybe we can't do that, but let's pray about it. Let's ask God about it. Let's see what God wants to do with it. A lot of times we get very satisfied, and this is where our faith goes. It goes from being an optimistic type of faith, and the older we get, if we're not careful, our faith goes to this. We get pessimistic. Then we see another disciple take center stage. Here comes Andrew. Simon Peter's brother, and he said to Jesus in verse 9, he said, well, hey, hold up, Jesus. Here's a boy, and this boy's got five small barley loaves, and he's got two fish. But how far, Lord, would that even go among so many people? you got to give Andrew a little bit of credit here, amen? Andrew knew there was a need, and he searched out. He was looking around, he said he went and he found this young boy. So Andrew was willing to work. 
Andrew was willing to search to try to figure out the problem. But usually this type of faith, it says, here it is, God. But God, what can you do with so what? With so little. Andrew's faith is an example of the second kind of faith that we see in our scripture this morning. Number two is this. Andrew saw the need, but he had a questioning and an uncertain faith. Many of us fall into this. Many of us. He had a questioning and uncertain faith. Andrew brought all that he could find to Jesus, but then he questions the meager resources. Isn't this what we do many a times? Amen. We say, well, God, here I am, but Lord, what can poor little old me do? Right, Lord? I'm just one what? I'm just one person. And this is what we're looking at in this situation. We look at the situation and the resources and we start to doubt or we start to question, well, God, what can you even do with so little? This type of faith, it oftentimes keeps us from reaching out. We'll tell ourselves that we love God and we want to see people come to God, but then something else happens and we tell ourselves that we have so little to what? To offer. We quit praying. We quit asking. And we start to become satisfied because in the back of our minds we think we can't instead of thinking that with God all things are possible. And one thing I've learned in pastoring over the 12, last 12 years is this. Every church, and hear me this morning, guys. Every church, whether small, in the middle, mega or extra mega large we all serve the same god all of us serve the same god and this same god has a will and a way for every church that loves him and for every church that is genuine and is obeying and is trying to do the will of god god has a plan when do churches start falling down? They start falling down when they quit trusting God and they put the trust in themselves instead of God. That's when churches crumble. Well, Lord, we'd rather put our trust in ourselves than put our trust in you. Well, that's you'll quit praying. You'll quit praying. You'll quit asking God. And you'll say, well, Lord, I've got a faith. But my faith seems to have more questions than answers. And then there's Jesus' example of the faith. And this is number three. Are you ready? Jesus expressed a positive and unwavering faith that went beyond what? That went beyond understanding. If you look at verses 10 through 13, now notice, I want you to look, what did Jesus do? He took what he had. Amen? He took what he had, that which made Philip doubt, and that which made Andrew question. He had five barley loaves, and he had what? And he had two fish, and he gave what? And he gave thanks. And then he filled their need, and the Bible says there was even what? There was even leftovers. Now, I want you to notice what Jesus didn't do. He didn't try to solve the problems with man-made solutions, did he? He didn't do that. And he didn't complain with the meagerness of the resources, nor question God's ability. You know, I've always looked at the feeding of the 5,000 in terms of just miracles that Jesus performed that day by feeding so many. But the older that I have gotten with a tad bit more wisdom, I'm starting to see that there's much, much more meaning behind God's Word. See, Jesus may have been testing the disciples, but I also believe these same tests of faith come our way today. Things happen in our lives, and I believe the Lord is watching. Amen? I believe the Lord is watching to see how we...
Some he's watching through this pandemic. Some he's watching before the pandemic. Some he's going to be watching after the pandemic. But I wholeheartedly believe that Jesus is watching. I believe sometimes Jesus is testing. How are we going to handle these things? What will we do? Who will we call on? Will we give up or will we hand it over to who? Will we hand it over to God? You know, a lot of people believe that these altars were built to glorify man. A lot of people believe that these altars were used and built to glorify a choir. A lot of people believe that these altars were built to glorify a music leader. But I'm going to tell you why these altars were built. Are you ready? These altars were built for you to pray on. These are praying steps. These are not just steps to help me get up here easier because I'm aging. These are not steps to help the choir get up here because they've got a loft. They can walk right down. These are prayer steps or what these things are called. This is an altar of invitation. It's a place where we come and we pray to God and we pray big, we pray small, we pray in between, we pray for ourselves, we pray for our neighbors, we pray for all people we work for, work with, it doesn't matter. But that's what these things are for. How has your faith been tested over the last 11 months? I know mine has. I know mine has. In this passage, Philip's pessimistic and doubting faith, it teaches us we should remember Hebrews 11, 6. Without faith, it's impossible to please who? It's impossible to please God if you don't have faith. In this passage, Andrew's questioning and wavering faith teaches us we should remember Proverbs 3, 5. And I would ask you all to remember this. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and don't lean on your own what? Don't lean on your own understanding. In this passage, Jesus' positive and unwavering faith reminds us of Luke one thirty seven. For in that passage, the Bible says, For nothing is impossible with who? Nothing's impossible for our God. So I want to ask you this morning, church, are you ready? Right now at this moment, if Jesus tested your faith today, what would your faith reveal? If he knocks on your door today, What's your faith going to reveal? If he knocks on that door today, is there a faith there to be revealed? Have you trusted in Jesus? Have you given your life to Jesus? Has your faith fallen on pessimistic times? Are you finding yourself asking yourself, why God, why God, why God? And you've quit trusting in God. Have you become like Philip and maybe it's just pessimism and you've forgotten what Jesus can do for your life, what Jesus can do for your church? Maybe right now God is testing you. Maybe maybe right now you're going through a trial and you just needed to be reminded that you can trust in God. You can call on the name of the Lord because the Bible says that He is always what? He's always here. Maybe this morning you just need to come and pray and say, thank you, Lord, for always looking over me, God. Maybe you need to come and pray this morning and say, Father, thank you for always providing for me. Thank you, Lord, for always knowing what's best for my life. Maybe that's you. Or maybe you need to come and pray this prayer this morning. Father, build my faith, Lord, so I will continue to trust in you more and more. And less in who? And less in me. Church, I challenge you this morning. As Billy comes and he gets ready to lead us in this invitation, this altar is yours. This invitation is yours. I'm going to be just as honest as I can with most of you all this morning. Are you ready? A lot of people's faith right now has become very stagnant. 
A lot of people have lost hope. A lot of people have lost joy. And they're looking for something. Well, let me tell you, you ready? They can ship out billions of vaccines. But that's not the kind of happiness that God wants in your life. He wants you to have a happiness that means something to you that no matter what happens in your life, you know that you're good. You know that you're saved. You know that you're sealed. You know that the Holy Spirit lives with inside you, and it doesn't matter what comes your way, what virus, what disease, what sickness, what trial, what temptation, whatever comes your way, you know that you are ready. Life is a series of tests. And I don't know which ones you're going through right now. But maybe you need to come and pray for strength. Maybe you need to come and pray for a rededication of your life to Jesus. Maybe you need to come and pray for your church family or your neighbors, your husband, your wife, your children. I don't know. But I do know this. Our faith needs to be re-energized. Amen refocused so this morning as you stand and we sing this is your invitation will you come